Well, you know, today is the last day of this series called Illusion, The Devil's Deceit Revealed. And the idea of this series is going back to Easter. Remember, as the women were making their way to the tomb to care for the body of their beloved teacher and rabbi, and they began to think to themselves, "Uh uh-oh, what about the stone? That giant ton and a half to two ton stone that sealed the tomb, something that was impossible for them to move, how were they going to get it out of the way so they could take care of their loving responsibility? Well, you and I know what happened. They didn't have to move it. Because what was impossible and immovable for them was simply pushed aside by God and his power. That's part of the victory of Easter. And we know that in our lives, there are what appear to be immovable stones. Things that the devil loves to tell us are beyond our capability, too much for us. But the thing about the devil is that when he speaks to us, there's one thing you can be certain of. Whenever he speaks to you, whenever he whispers in your ear, you can be certain that he is a liar. And that what he is saying to you is a lie. Jesus himself said that he is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And when he speaks lies, he's speaking his native language. Because he's the father of lies. But that's what comes out of his character. That that's what he perpetrates in our world and in our lives and oftentimes in our minds. But Jesus came to pull back that veil. Jesus came to to cut through all of the illusions so that we could see the truth. And there's a verse that's been the foundation of this entire series. We call it the key verse. It's from John chapter 18. Will you read it with me? For this reason I was born. And so, in a nutshell... Jesus came in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of the devil's illusions, to open our eyes. You know, I've been sharing with you some illusions as we go along, and I I brought one with me this morning. I thought you might get a kick out of this. Take a look at this little video. It looks like those balls are actually rolling uphill, right? Now, when Julie saw this last night, I showed it to her. She said, oh, it's magnets. It's not magnets. What it is, is illusion. Because of the markings and because of the angle, what's actually downhill appeared to be uphill. You know, these kinds of illusions are fun. But the illusions that the devil loves to to place before us, those seemingly immovable stones, they're not much fun at all. And over the course of this series, we've talked about a number of them. We've talked about stress, the kind of stress that that makes us feel so burdened, like we're going to crack. The pressure builds up. We've talked about regrets, those regrets that haunt us, and those those sense of something that we missed or something that we shouldn't have done that, that just hangs with us. What do we do? We talked about fear. You know, in a, in a world and in a life where terrorism looms large, when there are all kinds of things to be afraid of, and that's maybe the most reasonable response, how do we keep from becoming so frightened that we're paralyzed? Last week we talked about wounds, those scars, those pains from the past. What do we do and, and how do we move beyond the wounds that seem to never heal, that pain that seems to never go away? Well, this weekend, we're going to talk about emptiness, fatigue, weariness, because that feels like an immovable stone. We, we have this, this struggle in our world and in our lives where we become so burdened and, and so overwhelmed that sometimes it feels like we're completely drained. Where do we go and how do we get refreshment? Because the devil would love to say to us, there is no such thing. There's no refueling, there's no refreshment, there's no help, and there's no hope. And so lots of times we end up feeling like like some of these pictures. Let's take a look here. Does it look familiar? Does it resemble you? In fact, with with all of our students who are taking finals and tax tests and whatever else, probably does look familiar. How about this one? 
empty. Nothing left. Emotionally, physically, spiritually drained. How about this one? All the responsibilities, all the burdens, all of the things on the priority list, all of the family complications, all of it, does it leave you empty, out of gas? This next one? No tougher job than being a mom. Next one. That was me a few minutes ago. But I saved the one that I thought you'd like the best for last. How about this one? (laughs) Right there in mid-action. Absolutely fully engaged one minute and unconscious the next. When I see that picture, it reminds me of my son Jeff when he was a little boy. Jeff would go 100 miles an hour, and then wherever he was, he could be eating dinner, he could be running around somebody's house. I remember one time at some friend's house, we we walked out, he had been running around, and the next minute he was draped over a footstool, sound asleep. But life gets exhausting. Not just for little ones, it becomes exhausting for us. And we go and go and go. We're always trying to do one more thing, and we end up drained. What do we do? In Psalm 119, verse 28, there's a verse that I think speaks for us. I'd like you to read it with me. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. God, help us and strengthen us and refresh us according to your word. Now, the place I want to begin this morning as we talk about this weariness, this fatigue and emptiness, is the place that I've been every single week. It's the place that I start out, and I know that some of you are saying, yeah, 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 we get it. But the reality is that all too often, even when we hear it over and over and over again, we don't get it. And there are lots of folks who are here this morning for the first time in this series. And so I want to say it again. When it comes to these immovable stones, when it comes to these burdens that the devil loves to put in our lives, whether it's stress or wounds or regrets, whether it's pain from the past, or whether it's weariness, that sense of being drained and empty, we've got to be honest and we've got to be wise. Because the the things that I'm sharing here are are scriptural principles, and while they help us, there are also burdens and struggles. There's an emptiness that can become so great that we need to recognize the fact that that it's not going to be solved by by refocusing our lives, by retuning to God's Word, that we need professional help. That takes a lot of honesty, doesn't it? Because we live in a world and we live in a culture that says, you know what, you, you, should, you ought to handle it yourself. You ought to take care of it. You know, if, if you need help from somebody else, it means you're nothing but weak. That is another lie. It's another illusion. God created us to live in community, in fellowship with one another. He's given us all different gifts and talents, background and experience and passions so that we can come together and help one another. And we need to be honest enough to say, you know what, I've got something that I can't handle on my own. I need some help. And then wise enough to seek that help in places where we can really find it. Maybe it begins by by talking to one of the pastors. Maybe it begins by reaching out to a counselor. Maybe it begins in, in some other way. You know what the burden is, but the point is it takes that honesty to admit it and the wisdom to get the help you need. Everybody clear on that? Do I need to keep saying this for like the next 52 weeks? Well, maybe 20 or so. Okay, let's move on. And let's talk about the the issues that leave us feeling empty and drained. Because sometimes they're physical concerns, aren't they? And when I say this, I I say it with with a, a clear understanding. There are some among us whose physical issues are serious. Who are facing treatments and recovery from surgery and the, that whole exhausting diagnostic process. Who are dealing with physical issues that, that are draining them of energy. 
and, and you're getting all the help you can and you're doing everything in your power, but it leaves you feeling exhausted. Dear friends, I commend you for getting the help you need and I'm grateful that you are and know that, that I and others in this congregation will pray and stand with you as you go through those times. But the folks that I want to speak to this morning are the folks who are probably in a situation similar to where I was a few years ago. I didn't have a serious medical problem. I simply was neglecting my well-being wasn't paying attention to my diet, wasn't being physically active and getting the exercise that I needed. And you know what the devil began to whisper in my ear? This is just the way it is. This is just the way it's going to be. You're going to ache and you're going to have pains and you're going to grow weaker and you're going to be sick and your joints are going to hurt every time you come up these stairs. And that's just how it is as you get older. Don't worry about it. Soon you'll die. You know, I say it in a funny way, but dear friends, I couldn't be more serious. And it's a lie that the devil wants to tell us. Because while there are some in this room who are struggling to deal with the physical issues that are serious and require attention in a medical way, most of us in this room, when we're feeling exhausted because of, of physical struggles, it's not because of a serious issue, it's because we haven't paid attention to our diet and exercise. And I want to tell you something. It can change. With tiny little baby steps, with, with motions in the right direction, with the right kind of counsel and guidance, you can begin to feel better and stronger and healthier. You can begin to regain that energy that is lost. But it starts with the, with the concept, with that idea that goes along with eating an elephant, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you regain your health and your wellness? One step at a time. Some of us are also feeling exhausted and drained because of emotional issues. And again, we move into that area where some are dealing with very serious emotional struggles and you're getting help and counsel and perhaps receiving medication and doing other things to, to try and right the ship and, and move back to a healthier perspective, a healthier balance of emotions. And if you are engaged in that kind of treatment and that kind of care, I commend you. Well done. Because when we're facing those sorts of obstacles, they can steal all of our joy, steal all of our energy, and leave us empty. And if you are moving toward health and wellness, I congratulate you. But many of us, many of us are feeling empty and drained emotionally, not because of deeper issues, but simply because we're, we're marinating in our problems instead of solving them. You know what I mean by that, right? When we marinate in problems, when we are inactive and, and marinate in problems, we, we come like a tasty breast of chicken. Those problems soak in and they pervade our lives and they begin to affect everything about us. Instead of marinating, we need to solve problems. And while there are some problems that we need help to accomplish, there are other problems right in front of us that instead of being paralyzed and overwhelmed, we need to take that one step at a time approach and we need to begin to solve the things and deal with the issues that we can handle. And what's amazing about that is when we solve the issue, the simple part of that greater problem that we can handle, when we step into that solution, oftentimes it opens up and reveals to us what that next step needs to be. How many times, don't raise your hands, how many times do you and I procrastinate and become paralyzed with some issue that, that seems overwhelming or we just don't feel like we want to deal with it at all and the longer we procrastinate, the more we marinate, the bigger it becomes. Let's solve the problems that we can handle and move toward solutions and move toward victory. That brings me to spiritual issues. Because one of the things that oftentimes drains us and leaves us feeling without any energy, 
One of the things that oftentimes leaves us feeling far away from God, like we can't pray, like we're, we're not connected anymore, or when we battle with spiritual issues and spiritual problems. And I would tell you, dear friends, I don't know a Christian person. I don't know a person from, from pastor to lay person who has not at one time or another felt spiritually drained. It's a part of living with that old sinful self and the struggles that go on in our hearts and in our lives. But in the gospel reading for today, in John chapter 4, we gain some insight. And what I want to share with you are three points, three points that I, I think will help you as you deal with that sense of spiritual emptiness and weariness. Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that is, noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to get food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know, isn't it interesting how in our lives and, and even in the Christian church, so often we put up boundaries and we have these false barriers and we, we have these rabbit trails that lead to nowhere. When we feel empty and we, need, we feel drained, we need to know something for certain, that our God cares. You know, there's an interesting passage in John chapter 4 at the beginning of this story. In John 4 verse 4, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, at first glance, you may think that that, that had to go means that because he was on the, the southern part of Samaria and the, the most direct line to Jerusalem was right through Samaria, otherwise he would have had to walk in a large distance to get around that region, that that's what it means when it says he had to go through Samaria. But dear friends, I will tell you, I think that's wrong. I think the why for, for how, why Jesus had to go through Samaria didn't have to do with footsteps and distance. It had to do with a divine appointment that the Heavenly Father had ordained between Jesus and this woman who was spiritually empty. You see, she didn't know it. She, she knew that there were heartaches. She knew that there were struggles. She knew it as well as anybody else. But, but she looked around and she figured that's just how life is. The confusion and the hurts and the, and the lack, the, the distance spiritually and all of the questions that were unanswered, the emotional pain, that that was just how life went. Until she meets Jesus. You know, if you are feeling drained, if you are feeling far from God, if you are feeling discouraged or, or, or like you're struggling spiritually or emotionally, our God cares. The scripture tell us in Luke's gospel, Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. He came for people like us who get stretched out and poured out and crushed and broken. People like us who end up feeling empty. The text goes on. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and you knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and flocks and herds. You know, dear friends, when it comes to the devil's illusions, spiritually, those are the places that the devil has the best lies. Those are the places where he loves to twist and turn and take things out of context. Those are the places where he loves to take all of the junk, all of the stuff in our lives that's, that's real and imagined and pour it into us. And the more he pours into us, the more empty we feel. 
And one of the things that he loves to say as he lies to us, as he creates his illusions, one of the things the devil loves to say is you will never get out of the hole that you are in. That the place where you are, that this deep place, this desolate place, this empty, lonely place, this place that is dark and this place that is far away from God, that you can never, ever get out of that hole. And it's a lie. It's a lie that he tells to every single one of us at some time or another. It is a lie that comes from the father of lies. Because you know what God says. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you. That God knows that we're going to have hurts and troubles and heartaches and struggles in this life, but he doesn't leave us in any of them, and he never wastes our pain. But instead, he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That our God, our God loves us. And he doesn't abandon us just when we need him the most. And even when we can't sense his presence, he doesn't depart from us. He's continuing to work out that plan, continuing to guide us by his spirit. So what do we do? Well, it starts with repentance. Dear friends, if we're moving in the wrong direction, we need to be honest and wise enough to stop in our tracks and say, God, I'm going the wrong way. I'm doing the wrong things. I'm believing the wrong things. I'm living the wrong life. Father, help me. And the wonderful thing, when we call out to our God, when we're moving in the wrong direction, and we say, Father, help me. Father, forgive me. His answer to us is always the same. It is a resounding yes because he loves you. And the price that he paid in order to forgive you is a price that is so precious, it will never exhaust the forgiveness that God has to give. Begins with repentance, and it continues when instead of following all the philosophies of the world, all of the wisdom that's painted all over our lives, that instead we turn back to God's word. That we allow that word to begin to to change the way we think and the way we feel. We allow that word to begin to enliven our hearts and minds and draw us close to the Father. Because when we read the Bible, we're not just reading some ordinary book. We are reading God's word and his spirit is there with that word, touching our hearts, changing our lives, renewing our minds, refreshing our souls. Have you taken up a challenge that I issue almost every week? I will tell you that the brothers and sisters who report to me, those who've who've taken on that, that challenge of being in God's word for just five minutes a day, what they begin to tell me is that it changes everything. That they begin to look forward to that time because it it keeps them on track and it opens their mind and it reminds them of who they are and it helps them change the, the bad habits that are part of their life and it gives them a sense that there is always help. And because there is always help, there's always victory. You know, there's another lie that the devil loves to to use to create illusions. The lie that that gives us discouragement and a sense of hopelessness when the devil says to us, you will never, ever be free of all the problems. There's no escape. There's no way out. That, That problems come and then they layer more problems on top and the minute you solve one problem, there are going to be three or four more. That there are storms and heartaches and disappointments that constantly rage in our lives. I mean, even this morning, Pastor Zach and I were talking to one another and and we we both were trying to print something up in the administration office and the printer wasn't working because the power went out and something had to be reset and it was a big fiasco and, and so we couldn't print. Well, Last weekend when we got here, there was a different problem, and the printer wasn't working again. So he says, you know, it's just sort of like that. It's an adventure to figure out what's going to be wrong on any given day, right? Am I right? Yeah. 
And the devil loves to tell us, he loves to tap into that old sinful nature, that old pessimistic nature, and get us to believe that there is no help and there is no way out of the burden of problems that layer on and crush us until we die. But you know what our God says in the face of those lies? He says that that God of ours, that he has the power and the strength in Romans chapter 8 to work all things together for our good. That the good days and the bad days, that the heartaches and the victories, that all of the things that we face and all of the struggles that get layered into our lives, all of those things that begin to feel like they're going to crush us, that God says in the midst of every single one, he by his amazing power is working it together and shaping it for our good. As I said a moment ago, God doesn't waste our pain. He doesn't waste our hurts or our agony. But he uses those struggles to draw us closer to himself. He uses those difficult times to give us the strength we need for the days ahead and the ability to love and minister to the people around us who have the same kinds of burdens, the same kinds of pain. So what do we do? Well, in the midst of all of that, we continue to trust. We don't abandon our faith. We cling to our faith and we pray. We pray and we pray and we pray without ceasing. And we are humble enough to invite the, the prayers of our brothers and sisters in Christ around us because God calls us to carry one another's burdens. And so we, we inform and invite the people around us to pray with us, trusting that as we lift these concerns before God, that he will bring us the relief we need. You know how important prayer is? That God says when you are feeling so empty and so drained, when you are feeling so spiritually out of gas, that God sends his spirit. When we can't pray anymore, God sends his spirit to intercede on our behalf. That's how important prayer is. Finally, the devil loves to, to cast his illusion and say to us, you know, look at all these people. Look at those folks, you know, that family that looks so nice. Look at that couple who's holding hands. Look at those folks driving the nice car, or living in the nice house. Look at that guy who's, who's accomplishing all kinds of things at work. You will never be happy like that. That's for the special few, and you are never going to have happiness. You're never going to have real joy in life, and it is a lie. And he loves, he loves to tell it to you. Because the, the foundation of that lie is the truth that we don't all have the same blessings, that we don't have all the same gifts and the same opportunities, but that doesn't change the fact that our God does offer to us his blessings and his grace and his joy and peace. What our God says in the face of that lie is what we've talked about before from Ephesians chapter 2 that our happiness and our joy and our peace is not based on what we have, it's based on God's grace. That you are a child of the most high God, not because of what you have, not because of what you earn, not because of what you do or what you give or where you live. It, it's not based on you at all. Because when you take away all of the pretty clothes and the fancy smiles, the reality is that you and I are all broken and we are all sinful. And no matter how good we look on the outside, we are still struggling in our marriages, in our families, in our finances, in our lives. And so God doesn't base our well-being or our connection with him on something superficial. He bases our well-being and our connection with him on him on his grace, his unconditional, absolutely unchanging love for you and for me. What an amazing promise. 
And you know that promise doesn't end with God's grace. It's only the beginning. Because Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talk about that grace and how we are saved and connected to our Heavenly Father by grace. But verse 10 goes on, that verse I've quoted to you so often, Ephesians 2, 10, memorize this verse until it's in your minds every morning and every night because it goes on to say, for you are God's masterpiece. Did you realize it? Because when you're feeling down and you're feeling distant and you're feeling spiritually out of gas, it seems like you are anything but a masterpiece. But by God's grace and by his power, by his spirit at work in your life, it says that you and I have been recreated as his masterpiece to live a masterpiece life. That we're not defeated. That we are victorious. You know, I have one more picture what it looks to be, what it looks like to be worn out. Take a look. Physically exhausted, emotionally drained, life gone. And just before he reached this point of total exhaustion, he said those words. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It is finished. And the devil would love to tell us that when he said it is finished, he was talking about the strength of his body. He was talking about the the breaking point of his emotions. He was talking about the fact that, that bearing the sins of the world, he could carry them no more. He would love to paint an illusion and tell us this is what defeat looks like and this is where you and I are headed. But it would be another lie because this is no illusion. This, brothers and sisters, is victory. Because when Jesus said, it is finished, it wasn't because he was too tired to go on. It wasn't because his emotions were broken at the separation between he and his father. And it was not that he wasn't strong enough to bear the sins of the world. It's that by the power of the almighty God and the love that held him on that cross, he had accomplished for you and me what we desperately needed. That the one hero in all of the universe who could rescue people like us from sin and death and the devil, break those bonds and set us free, had accomplished God's almighty purpose. When he said it is finished, he was declaring our victory. And the promise that because of what he had done, we would never be empty again. You know, Jesus tells us in John's gospel, in this world, you will have trouble. When he says trouble, he's talking about stress and regrets and weariness and wounds and heartaches and pains and fatigue and emptiness. He says, you're going to have all of that. But then he goes on to say, but take heart. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. He has overcome our deadly enemy, the father of lies. He has overcome our sinful nature that that chains us to those terrible habits. He has overcome death itself as he stood risen from the grave. Dear brothers and sisters, this morning as you and I face a world that's filled with illusions, we stand in the victory of Christ with our eyes wide open to the truth. The truth that is declared succinctly when we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Gracious Father, work in our hearts and our lives this day that we might live in your victory. And Lord, while we oftentimes face what seem like immovable objects, bless us to know the truth, to lean on you, to be comforted and strengthened by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.